All right. So, which one of the two had a bicameral legislature, the Virginia or New Jersey plan? Virginia. Uh, we get rid of this. Yes, it was in Virginia. I got to get rid of this. Yeah. And so, what's the Virginia plan? So, after Shay's rebellion, after Shay's rebellion, what was the big fear of the elite? There was too much what? Democracy. Yeah, too much democracy. We've got to crush the mob. Government of a better sort. Oh, I just noticed this. We have wine or take all. They won't get wine or take all. I'm so tired of the tyranny of double wins. So, we got the 51 separate elections. We went through all that for the Electoral College. Which one? Wait a second. There are two houses then under the Great Compromise. Which one of the two was selected by the, by the voters, not the people, the voters? Which one of the two? The House or the Senate? The House. Yeah, the House of Representatives. How long is the term for the House? Two years. Two years. How long is the term for the Senate? Six. Six years. I'm lying to you with these numbers. Don't look at me. I'm misleading you. Don't trust me. Okay, you can trust me. Six years. Who picked senators at first? Oh. Yeah. yeah. And. Who picks president? Electors. Who? Electors. electors. Who picks electors? Still the way today. Who decides we're electors? <coughs> who decides who will be the electors? Yeah. <laughs> state assemblies. Today, state assemblies allow for the voters of every state. Actually, states could change the law, go back to state assemblies, or just say, hey, we're just going to pick these people to be permanent electors. Technically, they could do that. And well, some states it's in their state constitution, like Montana it is, but yeah, those, are, those can be changed. And so 51 separate election, uh, elections, how many electors does it require to be president? Yeah. I heard three different numbers. 270, yep, that's right, 270. How many members of the House are there? 435, yeah. 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, the electors, I'm sorry, there are three electors from the District of Columbia. So do we get to this one, who, who this favored? No. Who is favored by this system, big states or small states? Big, small? Small. Really favored small. I mean, really favored small. Oh sure, there's some things about big states and House representatives but the small states get such an advantage from this. And remember, this was the compromise. Nobody really liked it, but the idea was, is that right? That's not too bad. It's not right. Yeah, now you're all good. Once I say it, I don't know. The Senate, think about it. Montana has the same number of senators as California. Wyoming has the same number of senators as Texas. That means Montana voters have a greater influence over elections, over laws, than California because of the United States Senate. Not only that, then that goes to the Electoral College. Every state gets two electors for the senators. So think about it. A tiny state like Montana has four. Even though our population, if it was at least a little bit more by a portion of our population, we'd only have two. What a huge advantage for small states. Montana voters have a disproportionate advantage when it comes to the election because of the Electoral College. And don't forget, it's winner take all. Now, did I talk about two parties in here? So that's the last thing we got to get for a winner take all election. That is why in the United States of America, and it starts with the Electoral College, so you have to get this down. I didn't write this out. Write this down. Winner take all means always that there will be two parties and only two parties. I know there are third parties, but look at the percentage of votes that get. Almost none. There's only going to be two. There's only going to be two, and that's just the way it is. If there's election or winner take all, 
you will always kind of all the different ideas and different interests will kind of separate into two because if they separate into three that third candidate or third party will take away votes from the other two it will take away votes and so if it takes away votes do i really want to vote for somebody who might help the person i really hate be elected so what happens? Nobody votes for the third. They find one of the two that's closest. For example, in the state of Montana, the Libertarian Party you know, gets one or two percent of the vote. But in a close election like that, probably going to be the Senate in Montana, that could be huge. And most Libertarians are probably closer to the Republicans. If there was no Libertarian Party, the Republicans would probably get those votes. So it takes away from them. The same thing happens in other states. For example, what happened in 2000? The Green Party got about 4% of the national vote. The Green Party is significantly closer to the Democrats and the Republicans. And that helped George W. Bush win election, even though he lost the popular vote. That is why we have two parties. And if you say, I hate the two-party system, well, that's your stuff right every nation that has a winner take all has a two party system there might be a third party but like it's like in certain districts a third party replaces one of the two canada's like that the liberals and the new democratic party are pretty close so they just kind of balance each other out. but you look at australia you look at britain it's two parties the third party has no influence at all now you go to a country with proportional representation then you have multiple parties and it's totally different so our two party is relatively unique and so i'll let you know how many members of parliament how many different parties are in your parliament mm, well i voted this year yeah you so, voted so like yeah what's the voting age family in two? Well, it was for the EU elections. So that's 16. Yeah, like 16. In any, any country, that's all it is. Um, I don't know, like over 20, 25 or something. Yeah, there's, the ID is what, 5% of the vote? And you get seats in their part of the Buddhist world. You get 5% of the vote. So you have all these different parties. And so nobody has a majority. You have to get like a coalition of different parties. Italy's like that. France is like that. Most nations are like that. The United States is relatively unique. Yeah, I forgot you did vote. I forgot. Yeah, that's cool. Who's, then no one can vote. No. Luke, can you vote in this next election? No. I'll vote for all. No. You're welcome. Great. Who said that? Vote for us. That sounded pretty. <laughs> I heard that. Great. You're the voter. Mr. Barker, if you're voting for us, vote us for president. Us? Us. We'll be a coalition. And also, and also they have, but they have a different system. Now I see a phone out. Do I want a phone? Let me ponder that for a second. Put it away. And not again. And so, we have a separation of power. So the president is elected separately. And so once again, since I know you know, Britain is a parliament, Germany is the same way. It's not whoever wins a, a vote for their executive. They have whoever has the majority in their legislative body, whatever party, they pick their leader or the coalition leader to become, to become their, their executive. And Britain is a prime minister. The Labour Party has the majority, and the head of the Labour Party is their executive. We don't have that system. Germany is coalition, but their chancellor is a social democrat, and that's good. Otto? Is it Otto? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Otto. Otto yeah. I can't remember his first name. Oh, Olaf. Sorry. Olaf, that's Olaf, what it is. No, Otto, that's the, that's the other guy. <laughs> I have Otto in my head. He should be Otto. Yeah. He looks like an Otto. So, back to this. This is a clear advantage. For small states, clear advantage. So small states have a disproportionate voice. I know it doesn't seem like it. When in 2020, 
California had 55 electoral votes and Montana had three. But don't forget, nobody lives here. Except for the cool people, right? Wyoming, Wyoming has just has a little bit over half the population of Montana, and they too have a three electoral votes. We have three Dakota or two Dakotas. It should it probably be two someday. Two Dakotas. By the way, I just told you why there are two Dakotas. Four members of the Senate. That's why they have not one, but two Dakotas. The Republican Party in 1888 was worried about being the minority. So they made two states out of that. So they were, they're hoping for four Republican senators and at least six electoral votes. That's also the reason for Montana, Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming. All because they're hoping they'd be Republican states. And that goes back way back to 1888, 1889. So the Electoral College really favors small. So let's look at 2016. Oh, let me explain the red state, blue state. Red state is what political party today? Republican, Democrats are blue. That started in 2020. So remember what I told you, it's 51 separate little elections. Did I say 2020? Yeah. I meant to say 2000. 51 separate elections. And so what they did is once they had color television by 1968, they would show whoever won all the electoral votes. Remember, it's win or take all. They picked a color, red and blue, because the US red, white, and blue. And so they just alternated. One year, the Democrats would be blue, Republicans red, and vice versa four years later. So it just happened to be in 2000, the Republicans were blue and the Democrats were red. And all the networks, just all the major television networks for the election coverage agreed, next election, they just switch. But there was a contested election. There was only about 100 votes separating George W. Bush, the Republican, and Al Gore, the Democrat, in Florida. And it went on for a month. And the Republicans claimed they won by about 100 votes. They, they tried everything they could to keep them from recounting the votes to see if the Republican actually won. And so for a month, they just kept showing that map with Republicans as red, Democrats as blue, and it stuck. So that's why that's today, just purely from that election. By the way, does anyone know what happened? They were starting to recount. They started to recount. The, the Florida Supreme Court said, we're going to recount. The Bush campaign sued, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled five to four to stop the recount and get the election to Bush. So the Supreme Court ruled, don't count the votes, Bush won. So the Supreme Court gave the presidency to Bush. The recount almost certainly would have shown four won. So we have an interesting democracy. Bush was elected five to four. Al Gore won the popular vote. But back to this, 2016. Now, you look at this map. Montana has three. Can you see the numbers? It's kind of hard to see. Montana three, all the big hunk of three. You notice this big swath of red. It looks like a huge victory. But there's a lot more people living in the other areas. It's a razor thin election. Razor thin. In fact, just about 50,000 votes different in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin combined. And Clinton would have won those states, and Clinton would have been president. That's how close it was. Remember, 51 separate elections. And that's by county to give you even like a bigger idea of how the red state and blue state thing really is misleading. I should add, Lewis and Clark is misleading. Lewis and Clark was red. AKA a tiny majority, just barely voted for Trump in 2016 and 2020. The city of Helena, inside the city limits, overwhelmingly Democratic. Overwhelmingly. Just not even close. It's about 75 to 80%. And literally, you cross the city limits, and it's about 90% Republican. Like, literally, just cross city limits, boom, it's Republican. And that's pretty common everywhere. So back to this. Look at the popular vote. Remember, remember, the popular vote only matters within the state to pick the electors. You see it? Yeah, Clinton had a more popular vote by 3 million. But that doesn't matter. Trump was elected president in the Electoral College. Gore had a popular vote by a million. Didn't matter. 
George W. Bush was elected because of the Supreme Court in the Electoral College. So, just a few votes differently. And kind of creepy picture for both of them, but moving on. Here is the same electoral vote, but the states are by size given to the relative power per voter. The bigger the state, the more influence individual voters in each state. So for example, 255,597 voted in Montana in that election. Significantly more than Wyoming. You know, it's Montana, pretty big. Look at the power per voter in Wyoming or DC. And then look at the most populous state, California. That's the Electoral College. Nobody has anything like this. The whole thought was appease the states. They did not want democracy. And Madison sincerely thought it would kind of go away and all elections would be decided in the House. That's what he thought. Not at all. What happened? Let's do 2020. This is the election all of you probably remember at least fairly well. And look at the popular vote. You see it? Yeah, Biden won by 7 million votes. But remember, that doesn't count. What matters is the Electoral College. Now, Biden had a huge advantage. My guess is Harris is going to win by something like this. The popular vote. But remember, that doesn't matter. For a Democrat to win in the Electoral College, they have to get about 2 to 3% more in the popular vote just so they have a chance of winning because of the small states. So that's how the vote went. Nebraska and Maine, one electoral vote went to the others. Just a few thousand votes differently. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Georgia, or Arizona, and Trump would have been elected president. In fact, all of those states could have turned to Trump. Biden could have won by more than 7 million votes in the popular vote, and Trump would have been elected president. That shows you how, well, that shows you how close the election would be. That is by county. And the bigger the circle, the more people live there. And that gives you an idea how disproportionate it is. I also think it's kind of funny. No one in Montana. Lewis and Clark. And urban areas were the big ones. They vote mostly Democrat. Rural, overwhelmingly Republican. Overwhelming. Rain, no rain. It's literally, you call it the rain line. But that's about almost exactly where the 20 inches of rain line is. And so that's population. Yeah. It's really noticeable there, isn't it? Now, once it gets under 20 inches of rain, it's almost impossible to grow crops without irrigation. No one lives in. Thus, Montana. So let me show you one more thing. Look at how close these states were. Arizona, 10,000. Georgia, 11,000. Okay, Biden, Biden went pretty good in Michigan. Pretty good in Minnesota, which is 33,000 in Nevada. 20,000 in Wisconsin. That's how close some of these states were. Anybody want to guess? Which states are being overwhelmed with ads for president right now? Anybody want to guess? Can you read the list? What? What? You say it again? Wyoming. Yeah, Wyoming. <laughs> Always Wyoming. No. They don't care about Wyoming. They don't care about Montana. They don't care about California. They don't care about any of those states. They don't care at all except they care about Arizona, Georgia. Pennsylvania is being inundated with ads. And if you go on the YouTube and your ISP address is in Pennsylvania, you will get continuous ads for president. You know, Montana, we get the she tester ads. There it's all president. And here's why. Montana is going to Trump. So why put me money in that? California is going to Harris. 15% for Harris. New York for Harris. All of the, these states are going for Trump overwhelming. 
but Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina is going to be razor thin, probably Harris. Georgia razor thin, Arizona razor thin. I would bet Trump, but you never know. The point is that's where the election is decided. What state in 2020 got the most votes for Harris? 2020? California, that makes sense. Most populous state. California, 55 electoral votes. Texas, 36. 29, 20. Illinois is 20. What state gave the most votes for Trump? Texas? California did. Does that make sense? Yeah, by far the most. So all those votes for Trump, they're lost. They're gone. They don't matter. So all that matters is Biden, people want to say Harris in 2024, but Biden won California, it's about all 55 electorals. What state gave the second most votes for Harris? Biden. Biden. Texas. Although, that's a Harris. I'm sorry, I meant Biden. I'm, I'm stuck in the 2024 mode of Harris versus Biden. Or Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Harris versus Trump. Back to this Biden versus Trump. The second most votes for Biden was in Texas. All those votes are lost. So you get how we don't have a popular vote. Our votes in Montana, I mean, it's going to vote for Trump. So you vote, you vote, they voted for Biden, about 42% voted for Biden, they're lost. Because mm -hmm. all the vote, all the electoral votes. Because we don't have a popular vote. And so that's an issue. Last thing, that's what it looks like today. A president can win election by only being on the ballot in 11 states. In fact, they can win an election by only winning those 11 states by one vote. So literally, only having 11 more votes in 11 states, they could be elected president and not be on the ballot in 39 states and the District of Columbia, and not even be on the ballot. That's the system. So I think you can guess the state. You know, look how much Texas. Texas is just booming. There's no zoning law, so housing is relatively cheap. There. Hmm? Electoral votes. That's what it is in this next election. And it'll be like this all the way through 2030. So that's the Electoral College. I had to explain a little bit about this weird system the United States has. Nobody else would, would do this. And don't forget, it's not a single election. It's 51 separate little elections for the Electoral College. Yeah. Yeah. So, are there any questions about the Electoral College? It is not, and this was on purpose, it is not democratic. That's, it was not, that's on purpose. Madison wanted even to be less democratic. It turned out to be not democratic at all, even though sometimes, most of the time, the popular vote matches, matches the, the, uh, the election most of the time. But in my lifetime, it's happened twice. And since 1992, a, a Democrat has won the popular vote in every election except one. The 2004 election. Other than that, the Democrats, the Democrats have the majority of voters. But rural states vote Republican, and therefore they get all the senators. And that's the situation we're in now. Montana, my guess, will probably have two Republican senators in the next term. If I, if I had money, but we'll see. All right, so that is the first compromise. Let's get to compromise number two. The three-fifths compromise. Okay, obviously the great compromise has the most direct impact on us, but three-fifths is huge. And it's going to be significantly more controversial. So every 10 years, they have to do a census for population for two very important reasons. And the census is this massive operation. I should add, they probably undercounted 
in the last census because of COVID. So we have a kind of a weird situation right now. That's part of the reason Montana probably got its second seat, is they probably undercounted people in some other states. But now that we got it, we're not giving it up. Well, every 10 years, they have to do the census. And it doesn't say citizens. It just says people living in the states. Just anybody living there, they count towards the census. Technically, but not completely. What about slaves? So, but back to this. There's two big reasons why. One is for representation. They have to do the census to apportion the seats in the house. But also, they call it direct taxation. They originally got and tried this a couple times in the Continental Congress. They would tax per state by population. So, for example, they would get the population of each state, and then each state would pay proportional to their population taxes. So New York would pay so much, Virginia, Rhode Island. The greater the population, the more tax you pay. This is pre-capitalism. Our concept, every one of our concept of income did not exist, at least as we understood it yet. So this is just this kind of value added whatever. Now there's two ways. Here's the big issue. Will slaves count as people towards representation? Will slaves count as population towards taxation? Hmm. Which section wants slaves, north or south, want slaves to be counted as people for, for representation? More people, more members of the house. Where are there more slaves? South. The south. Who wants slaves to be counted as people towards taxation? The North. That means the South would have to pay more taxes. So the North, they want the slaves counted for that. The South wants slaves counted for here. Now, you'll notice something. I'm not talking about whether or not slaves should be illegal. And they all knew slavery is whole record. They all knew it's immoral. They all would like a situation where they don't have it. And of course, those who have slaves or make money from it don't want to give it up. So this is not about slavery being legal or not. This is about counting them towards population. Thus the compromise. When they count to the census, for every five slaves will count as three, or one slave will count as three-fifths of a, of a person towards population. The Constitution says for every five, it's three. Three slaves or three fifths of a person. Oh, went away. Sorry. I was wondering why everyone's going to look at me intensively. Three fifths of a person. No, it does not mean that they are. It's not like, and we're not going to measure them as three fifths. It just means that's how we're counting. So we have 500 slaves, it counts as 300 people towards your population. The three-fifths compromise. Now, I want to be very clear about this. This has nothing to do with slaves having rights because they're slaves. It has nothing to do about voting. Slaves are not citizens. This is not they have three-fifths of rights, a three-fifths of a vote, or three-fifths of a member of, of the legislature. It's just towards population. I'm telling you this, and a lot of you are like, well, of course, that's obvious. One of you, maybe more, on the, the test, either this or the final, will write down that this is three-fifths of a vote. One of you will do it. Look around. You probably know who it's going to be, right? One of you will do it, because it happens every year. Slaves, this is not, slaves are not citizens. This, and anybody who benefits from this, is certainly not the slaves. So this is the actual from Notes of Madison when they're talking about that. That's why I put that up. And slaves are not citizens. So who's his favorite? Which section, north or south? It really favored the south. Everyone got that? Because they never did this. They tried a couple times. It was so impossible to work out. They just never did it. It's called direct taxation in the Constitution, which is kind of confusing. And wait a minute, think about doing this now. It totally helped us out. Total. Massive aid. Because that means 
there's going to be more representatives per voter. Or another way to look at it is more representatives per citizen, which are not enslaved people. If you go by color of skin, white people in the South. And more in the House and more in the Electoral College. And the name for this is going to be slave power. Northerners will despise slave power. The advantage this gives the slave states and slave owners. A whole series of laws will be passed. Favoring slave states because of the Three Fifths Compromise, a famous one which we'll get to called the Missouri Compromise. There will be a couple presidents elected solely because of slave power. Most importantly, Thomas Jefferson. He never would have been elected president if enslaved people were not counted as citizens. I'm sorry, counted as population. Counted as population. It, the, the Constitution did not say what a citizen was. And so if I say citizen, it's just kind of habit. The Constitution is really unclear about citizenship to this day. There's elements that are in there, but it, they're debated. It's a big deal. Slave power. So there's going to be many Northerners who will be opposed to the extension of slavery, not because they hate slavery so much, even though they don't want it in their home. It's because of slave power. Everyone got that? All right, so what do these 12 presidents have in common? Hmm? Yeah, those, therefore, we've had 12 presidents that have been slave owners. 12 presidents. Hmm. Adams didn't own slaves, for example. Van Buren was opposed to slavery, but had slaves it's when he's in Washington, D.C. Ulysses S. Grant despised slavery. But when he got married, his father-in-law gave him as a wedding gift to humans. And he didn't know what to do with them. And so finally, when he thought he could get away with it and not offend his father-in-law, he, uh, he, gave, he freed his slaves and gave them some compensation. He despised slavery, but he still owned Peelman's, still did it. All of his labels. But like Pierce, Buchanan, you know, they didn't own. So, number three, the slave trade or slave trade compromise. So. Looking for the vultures to come back. So, the thing is, everybody wanted Congress to regulate trade, but would they relate, regulate interstate commerce? This is going to be a big deal. This is going to mean whether or not, whether or not Congress can decide put tariffs on goods, not or control state trade, and so. What the decision was this, states states would, re or I'm sorry, the federal government would regulate commerce. They would regulate commerce and the slave trade will be left alone for 20 years. Left alone for 20 years. Now, the idea was they could put a tariff or a tax on slaves and the inter international slave trade. This is an anti-slave trade poster, and it's trying to show the cruelties of this middle passage, which we can't even wrap our mind around how awful it was, but in the shadow of the United States Capitol. Everybody knew it was horrible. And Madison would write in his notes, in 20 years, this pernicious, which means evil, this pernicious institution will go away. And so, Oh, I jumped the gun here. That was a plan. Would it go away in 20 years? The international slave, slave trade, the United States would ban it. So we could say, we're not doing this. But nobody guessed what the Industrial Revolution would do. They, it was incomprehensible. They had no idea how the world would be a totally different world in 40 years. Totally different. 
So those are the three compromises. So we have the three fifths, we have the great compromise, and the slave trade. This is a biggie, the regulating commons. Think about what you're wearing right now, what you have in your possession right now. My guess is virtually nothing. I would, I would be surprised if there's anyone in here who had something that was solely from Montana. I bet there's no one. I bet everything has something from out of state, across state lines. And even, even if you get something like, whoa, oh, this, this, you know, this was grown in Montana, I bet the fertilizer came from out of state. If it crosses state lines, the federal government can regulate it. That's why there are environmental laws. That's why there are child labor laws. That's why there's worker safety laws and food quality laws. It's because of interstate commons. This is a big deal. I should add that the Supreme Court um, last year just ruled that most regulations can now be overturned. And so in the next four or five years, my guess is most environmental, environmental regulations, especially in worker safety, food safety too, will be gone. We'll see. It's called, it was the Chevron Doctrine. Big deal. Big deal coming up. You guys live in an exciting time. It was so drab and boring when I was your age. Sure, we had the threat of nuclear war, but other than that, oh, wait a minute. We're at a bigger threat of war than ever. Who just invaded their neighbor? Israel just invaded Lebanon. The United States just sent 10,000 additional troops and an aircraft carrier group. We are on the edge of war right now. It's a big deal. I'm old, so good luck. I'm actually being quite facetious. It's terrifying. So, separation of powers. Madison was a firm believer in this idea that powers must be separated. And he was a, there was a French philosopher by the name of Baron de Montesquieu. Here's Montesquieu right there. And this is when they try to draw him like a Greek or a Roman philosopher or a senator. He, he grew up, he wrote during the period of Louis the 15th. And he wrote about the tyranny of one person or branch controlling all bodies of government. And what he said is the executive, the judicial and legislative must be separate. Madison was a big believer in that, with the idea of being part of the reason for the tyranny. You're going to get your hands dirty, but you understand small machines, right? Yeah. We're getting some tools. Great. <laughs> All right, so separate the powers. And even though it's not written in the Constitution, Madison was a firm believer of that, and he called it checks and balances. Or we call it today checks and balances. No, it's not that the three branches are balanced. It's not that the three branches have some kind of equal power. But the idea being is that they have some kind of check on the powers. The checks are pretty vague, especially for the judicial. But every branch in the Constitution has enumerated powers. Don't worry about this. I'll explain this in just a second. Enumerated or listed powers. These are also called clauses. And these enumerated or listed powers are clauses. The idea being that these are our powers. And if the legislature has these powers, the executive has these powers, one group can't um, come to dominate, or dominate the government. I should add. One is going to have the most power, by far. One is, uh, the judicial doesn't really say anything. 
So all the power the court system has, they just kind of gave themselves. The Constitution doesn't say anything about the court system. So I'll have to explain that. Now, what they have is you have all these in pictures of it. I'm going to draw very quickly. So I put this up here when I had to do this for uh, COVID, and I left it. Remember those heady days of the hybrid classes in COVID? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Man, it's tougher, didn't it? That was what, I, I thought that was a nightmare. And I still had, so every once in a while, I had like a dream that we go back to it, and it, it terrifies me. This triangular of the three different branches of government. I should add, most countries do not have this. If they have a parliament, the executive and the legislative ban branch are like this. It's not like the United States. We're very down? unique. Hmm? Can we take a picture no, that? I'm going to write it up on the wall. So, <laughs> let's do this. No luck? No, they won't. The door is closed. What do we do? Knock on them. Did you beat your head on it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, the heater, it's not only rattling, but it's broken. It's not working. It's warmer in here than usual. It should not be putting it should not be putting heat out. The heat is off. And it is still putting heat out. Huh? I turned the thermostat to zero. I'll turn it all the way down. In my first class too, Murphy They clearly went through the boiler and turned the heat on all over the building. Okay. And then all and but then we can still turn it down. And so all the ones that are, you know, these are over 50 years old. Yeah. Yes. And they're never going to replace them in our lifetime. Back to this then. Let me draw this up for you. Let me do the first one really quick. So it's going to be a triangle. There are nine articles <coughs> of the Constitution. The first article has most enumerated powers. That's the legislative. But it's not the one with the most power. It's the executive branch. And so we put that on top. The executive or the president, four-year terms. And this is immense power. The first one we have to get is they sign or don't sign bills to become law. What do we call it when the president does not sign a bill? Yeah, veto. But here are the key elements. Okay, from the term executive, we get the idea it you know, carries out the laws. But it's more than that. They interpret and execute the laws. They interpret and execute laws. So we're going to draw legislative and judicial. We'll do this really quick. I know this is kind of government, but we have to do a little bit of this. Government and, and history go hand in hand. So Congress writes laws. A lot of times they're very vague. And it's up to the president to decide how they'll be enforced. So the president literally the executive branch literally goes through and interprets the law, and this is how we'll enforce it. This is immense power. Immense. <clears throat> and we call this, however the president interprets laws, we call it an executive order. An executive order. So that's just saying how the president will carry out the laws. And a lot of times they'll announce this like on the news, or you might read it. They'll say, the president made an executive order, almost like the president is making law. They kind of are in a way. But it's how the president will enforce worker safety, food safety laws, et cetera. Congress gives the federal, the Food and Drug Administration the authority to look at the safety of certain food products and certain uh, pharmaceutical drugs, whatever. But then they make the decision how to care, how or what's going to happen with those approving drugs, approving certain food additives, saying some food is dangerous, that sort of thing. And those are all executive orders. Almost all of our interaction with the government is through the executive branch and it's through how they carry out laws. So the president doesn't make law, but they decide. And this is huge. If a president believes in environmental laws or laws that will help workers, then they'll enforce it. If the president does not in believe, believe in environmental laws or worker safety laws, then the president won't enforce them. 
I mean, we have this stark re realization in your lifetime as a pre as a human. Your first president was Bush. How did he feel about environmental laws? He's a conservative Republican. He despised them. Didn't enforce them. How did Obama feel? A moderate Democrat. He encouraged most of them. How did Trump feel? Trump despised environmental laws. In fact, is threatening to basically not not um, enforce them at all. He's reelected. You can say that's good or bad, but that's what he wants. Biden, much more for this. It's a big deal. Harris, much more for environment. Biden against, yeah. But these aren't vetoes. This is how they enforce previous laws. Congress doesn't pass any laws today. So all the president does is former laws. Everyone got their homework? All right, goodbye.
Yeah, it should be pretty easy. It's just like a So, somebody, it was cold this morning, but it's going to get like 80 degrees today. It's September, but someone was cold. Does he have to meet for now? And now, my thermostat's at zero. 45. But you can't crush it. I bet you you can't crush it. I get fresh when you do that. Oh, yeah? Have we talked about my problem with, with goldfish? Yes. Yeah. yeah, what? What's the problem? They don't taste like goldfish. Yeah, they don't taste like goldfish at all. No, this is a real thing. They, they taste like goldfish? Yeah. Mm. What do goldfish taste like? Goldfish. Very good. Little like horse. All right. So, I've had horse once. France, you know. Yeah, it tasted. Okay. Like I could, I don't like it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.